Aloha, and welcome to another episode of A Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Thanks for joining us today. As you know, Likeable Science is all about how science is a vital and interesting part of everyone's life, how scientists are really interesting people and doing interesting, fun things that really relate to everyone's lives, that meet, have meaning in people's lives. Science is not some isolated endeavor that takes place in ivory towers. And today, I have with me here, Mohammed Yaqub. Welcome, Mohammed. Thank you for having me on the show. Yes, indeed. Mohammed got his uh, PhD from the University of Minnesota a few years ago, and he currently works at a group called Sciline, who, who, who really fascinating stuff. Sciline is this nonprofit organization in Washington, D.C. that connects journalists with scientists and to get accurate science portrayed well out to the public, right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. No, it's, this is critical work. It's in, in a lot of way parallel to what we do here on Likeable Science, right? It is, yeah. yeah. So um, this is, uh, I'm real pleased to have Mohammed here, and, and he's actually out visiting Hawaii and, and, and decided <laughs> to take, take some time out from his vacation to come and, and help out here. So it, it's great. So uh, maybe let's just start with a little, a little bit of background about you. It's sort of, sort of what got you into science. How did you, why did you like science? What, what drove you into science or drew you into science, I should say? <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, that's great. That was so long ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I grew up in a traditional Indian family, so okay. I'm an immigrant to the United States, been here for like 25 years now. Okay. Um, but coming from a traditional Indian family, my parents had various, had expectations of us, as okay. most parents do. But I was going to be the, I was expected to be the medical doctor. My younger brother was expected to be the lawyer, and then the youngest was expected to be the professor. Okay. Um, so that was like always in the back of my mind. I was like, this is what I have to do. Um, spoiler alert, none of us are doing those things. <laughs> um, but I did realize that um, in the process that I really do enjoy science. Uh -huh. okay. um, and that really happened when I was at uh, community college. I was taking my intro biology class and um, trying to finish my general ed education requirements. And the professor taught that class with such passion. Um, and that's when I was like, yeah. science is not just a done deal. It's a process, right? Yeah, absolutely, um, absolutely. It's a, it's a vital dynamic field. Yeah, yeah. Not right? like, names. We all remember like dissecting that mouse, and it's like it's always terrifying. But like standing there and being like, okay, this is how all these organs work. That's what I remember of science. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it's great that you that you got that understanding and that that, that helped help draw you on into the field. And uh, then you you ended up uh, pursuing an uh, advanced degree, a PhD. I did. And, and that must have been a little bit of a challenge for you. <laughs> So that was, um, I finished my master's and got a job as a, a researcher in a plant biology lab. It was great, mm -hmm. but at that point I realized that I cannot really lead any project. I would mm -hmm. always have to work on other projects, so I couldn't contribute to like the leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and while I enjoyed doing the research, I wanted to start doing my own projects. Mm -hmm. And that's when I, uh, for that, in order to write grants to really support the kind of work, um, I needed a PhD. Mm -hmm. Also, the look on my parents' face when I told them I was going back to get a PhD, not only did I not get a medical degree, but now I was going to back to school and going to study weeds, as they call them. Priceless. That's, this was they, the, they weren't super happy with they, it. You know, like me, they too learned what a PhD is all about. Yeah, it's a long process, for sure. For sure. And, uh, and then you... Uh, I gather you did, you did have a brief stint where you worked in an in emergency room or something? Yeah, so going back, actually, so before... Um, grad school, so when I was an undergrad, um, I did, I, I, I was like, okay, my parents expect me to be a medical doctor, I'm gonna do all the things, and I like biology. I was like, I'll job shadow in the different venues, right, of uh, in the hospitals, and it was great. I, mm -hmm. well, I did pediatrics, it was great, I did, I don't remember, some other thing else. Finally, junior year, I was allowed to job shadow in the ER, mm -hmm. and this was spring break, super excited, I was like, this is gonna be it. So I went in that Monday morning, Monday, the day passed by, it was really quick, I don't remember much of it. Tuesday morning, I went in and we had two cases. So one was uh, an accident, and they brought the patient in, and she was unconscious. And I remember the doctor trying to find a vein, and so they kept like putting trying to put IV in. At one point, the nurse just pushed me to the side. She was helping the doctor, obviously. And I was just standing there, horrified. And like before, we could take a moment, like once they stabilized the patient, um, there was another um, attempted suicide case that came in, and so that was with like cops, and they were they an overdose of drugs. So they were pumping the stomach. And I remember leaving for lunch and just never going back. Like, I was like, this is it, I'm done. Um, I don't, I mean, I'm very amazed that people do that. That's clearly not me. Yeah, yeah. No, isn't it interesting how, how a, a brief pivotal experience can really shape your life, uh, right? You know, it just drove, drove you away from medicine. It, it did. Yeah, interesting. Um, what was interesting though is like, now I was like, okay, now I'm a junior, and I'm back to the drawing board. Now what do I do, right? right. Like, I was like, okay, so science is medical doctors, because that's what I'd right. always learned. Right. And so I was like, okay, I don't know what to do. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna finish a biology degree and do something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. 
and you got into plants and I did, yeah. So I took a genetics class and the professor was again, she was a plant geneticist. And I was like, genetics makes sense, right? There's like the right. general genetic concepts. And the professor, super nice um, faculty member. And she explained to me, she's like, okay, if you want to do research, you can do research and contribute. Um, it doesn't have to be in medicine. Right, right. So I know, and that's, and that's a great, it's a great field. And God, genetics is moving on so fast now in genomics it's, and uh, understanding how our own genes and the genes of all the little microbes who live uh, within us are all oh, playing games together. And I'm amazed at where we've come and where we're going. Yeah, yeah, isn't it? Uh, isn't it? And it's, it's nice what you point, point out there, that you have these key figures, these key teachers who really help, help shape your direction of your, of your life and career. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's important. So then you were studying plant evolution. Now most people would think you're studying plant evolution, you're gonna go out into savannas or fields or <laughs> deserts or forests or some place where there's some plants. But you chose to study plants in an urban environment, which I, is very strange. I t well, it's a lot less strange, right? Because we walk around and there are plants all around us. Mm -hmm. um, there are plants on the side of roads, in mm -hmm. alleys, um, mm -hmm. and cities, especially in the northern um, continental United States, um, cities tend to be warmer, they tend to be drier. So as we see this image, there's plants on the side of roads, right? So right. the ones on the left, are experiencing a drastically different environment than the ones on the right. Mm -hmm. um, so, right? And so if we just go with um, like sampling, like cities are warmer, they're drier, they're more polluted. How does that affect plant growth and development? Okay. So that's what I got interested in. Oh, I see. Yeah. It, it's, it's interesting, they're, they're actually now doing studies on animals too that live in cities and they're finding, for instance, the birds' hearing is being affected by all the background noise. They, yeah. Some of their behaviors are, are being affected by all this constant interaction. It's, it's crazy, right? Like, they found that birds have shorter wingspans. Right. Mice in Central Park are distinctly different from those around. Huh. Um, that was just amazing to read. I was like, oh, <laughs> evolution did not happen on thousands. Like, this is right. rapid no, evolution. It, it happens very quickly, <laughs> and, and animals and plants are incredibly adaptable. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's the population of coyotes within the city limits of Chicago is estimated around 2,000. Really? There are 2,000 coyotes living. Within the city of Chicago? Yeah, huh. right now. Well, next time I visit my brother when he's there, that's what we'll have to go do. <laughs> Hunt some coyotes, yeah, all right. <laughs> there you go. Well, that, that's great. And so, what, what kind of, so specifically, what, what did you, what was a day in your, in your life as a, as a uh, urban plant genetic? <laughs> yeah. you know? so, um, so, essentially, I was really interested in cities are really just warmer environment, right? And it's this, whereas around them, if we think of it, like geographically, is a cooler, Right, environment. Mm -hmm. So it's just that distinct difference. Um, how does that affect like our plants then becoming different? And if we think about it as like one city, fine, that might not make a mm -hmm. difference. But there are many cities on the landscape, and all of a sudden, how can these start affecting other populations? And is there migration like right with pollen and with seeds, so mm -hmm. with plants moving? Oh, okay. And so that's what got me interested a lot in that. And so I went and sampled, I collected seeds in the cities of these weeds or mm -hmm. annuals, short little perennials. Um, and then went outside about 50 or so miles, so outside the heat island effect. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where the heat island the, uh, effect, um, heat, the heat of the city extends mm -hmm. to. Um, and I sampled seeds from there as well. And so those are the ones that I planted in the common environment and then mm -hmm. measured various aspects. Okay. And then the differences we see at that point are due to genetics because the environment is constant. Oh, okay, you, you grew them all in a common I did, okay. yeah. Interesting, interesting. And you found that the plants did indeed grow differently. The plants did indeed grow differently right. and then the, the urban ones, I guess, were maybe a little more drought tolerant? They were drought tolerant, but they were also bigger and they grew faster. And they didn't seem to have any, um, it, most plants, when they grow faster, they tend to produce fewer seeds, right? There's some trade-off. Right. Um, in this case, it wasn't. The ones that grew bigger, they grew faster, and they had more seeds. So it was mm -hmm. this whole, like, what is driving this? Right. Well, it sort of makes sense in an urban environment, right? I mean, it pays to grow quickly because you never know when you're going to step That's on. That's right. You and, get like lawn mode and it's done. Right, and you better produce a lot of seeds <laughs> because a whole bunch of urban environment is concrete, which is very inhospitable to seeds, right? Statistically, one of those will have to make it. Right, some, some you got to find one that's in a little crack between the, the concrete blocks, exactly. basically. Yeah. Um, oh, that, that's, that's fascinating. That, um, that, 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 that was great. Um, what was interesting is the same pattern, so I also got Fortunately, um, this was grad school, right? The mm -hmm. joys of grad school. I had the opportunity to sample also in Detroit, in Chicago, in New York, and in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And we found the same patterns in all those cities. So we're seeing that that's, uh, that is a consistent oh, pattern. In interesting. That's, yeah. that, no, it's very neat. Of course, very valuable to do that in multiple sites. So yes. You, you see, it's not just a flute. It's not just Minneapolis yeah, and St. Paul, right, yes. Right. Excellent, excellent. Has this kind of work been replicated in other continents? I mean, in St. Petersburg and Moscow. And, <laughs> so um, I don't know about other continents. There is, a, there are, there's a group out in um, Toronto, okay. um, and that's truly really trying to bring all this urban ecology. So urban ecology as a field has really started picking up in the late, in the mid '90s. Mm -hmm. 
And then since then, it's picked up. So there's been a lot of work done in Arizona, but that's on the flip side because cities tend to have a lot more water in the summer because people are watering. Okay. And so it's the, the exact opposite of mm. what the northern cities are. So there's that kind of dynamic that's happening. Yeah. 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 Interesting. And it would be interesting to look down at equatorial cities versus, exactly. yeah, versus cities um, like Toronto. Or, yeah. And then like, if we think about like island cities, like, that's a whole other aspect, right? right. So, yeah, and, um, int intriguing. And uh, so during this time, as you did this, I mean, it sounds like you could have gone on forever and ever, you know, studying more and more things, different aspects of, of this, looking at uh, soil conditions or, as well, or water instead of heat, da, da, da. But you obviously, your, your interests expanded or took so, somewhat different directions. Can you talk a little bit about sort of what, what drove, drove that? Yes, absolutely. No, so I love science. I love the process of science. It's great. I get to do science. But it was nice to get to go share that science. Too often science, as you mentioned earlier, is, uh, gets done in an ivory tower, but that's changing. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be in a lab just doing research and then publishing. And again, not that those are any bad things. It was just not for me. Right. Um, and so I had the opportunity to actually set up my field sites at three high schools and one community college. Um, right? So it was, it, was a, it was like one of those things where I was like, this will be great. Let me get students to think about science with me. Um, what I will say is students are amazing. They came up with ideas that I had not even thought of. So this, I remember this one group, they were, like, they were very concerned about um, animals coming into the field site. Mm -hmm. So they measured the field site. They built a fence around the field site. Mm -hmm. right? And it was great. Another group wanted to measure how much sunlight will hit each plant at any given time. Mm -hmm. And when we calculated those, there will be 3,000 plants times four field sites, it became a little less feasible. <laughs> and that's when we discussed like, what we measure and why we measure. Mm -hmm. right? um, so it's like we might measure plant height, and that'll tell us something. But do we measure that every day? Does that tell us something? So right. our quantification methods are also changing. Right, um, yeah. Do you measure plant weight? How do you measure the weight? Dry, wet? Exactly. You know, All these factors. Uh, including um, roots, not including? Play a role. And, uh, but the, the students were always amazed. They're like, oh, let's do this, let's do this. And it was like, you know what, let's try it. Yeah. And then the great thing is, of course, then you also have all this extra, these extra hands. That, um, so you, you can do experiments that you could not do by yourself. Exactly, right? right? And you don't have to pay them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, they were engaged. Right. Yes. Exactly. Um, no, it was great. Wonderful. Well, that's, that sounds like a, a real uh, enriching and expanding experience. And I yeah. can see where that would then lead you to want to do even more of that kind of thing. Because yeah. the... the Getting people excited about science and having yeah. people who don't particularly care about science suddenly begin to see the beauty of science, the power of science, the value of science. Right. That's, I mean, that's so science, again, as I mentioned, is like so often thought of in, as lab codes, right, mm -hmm. in the lab. Um, so I have an image. I want to say it's uh, image two, and I think um, it was put uh, earlier. So that is science. Right. So those are what my field sites look yeah. like. Yeah. The one on the right is adjacent to a school, so that mm -hmm. building is actually the school. Yeah. And those kids were involved in like helping plant and at each site, we measured temperature, we collected cool. soil. Um, cool. This is science. Excellent. And we're going to talk more science when we come back. We have to uh, go to a break right now. Uh, Mohammed Jakub is with me. I'm Ethan Allen, your host in Likeable Science, and we'll be back in one minute. Hello, I'm Mufi Hadamid. I want to tell you about a great show that appears on Think Tech Hawaii. It's all about tourism. In fact, we call it Tourism 101, where we talk about the issues and challenges that faces our number one industry throughout the state. We'll have some interesting guests, some very informative dialogue, and allow you an opportunity to maybe learn a little bit more about why this industry is so important for our state. It's been great for us in the past. We need it today, and especially going forward. That's Tourism 101 on Think Tech Hawaii. Mahalo. Hi, I am Yukari Kunisue, host of Konnichiwa Hawaii, Think Tech Hawaii's Japanese program. Broadcasting every Monday from 2 p.m. I usually invite a guest in Japanese language community who does interesting things, and I'd like to share stories with you guys. Please tune in and listen to Konnichiwa Hawaii. Welcome back to Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today in the Likeable Science uh, the Think Tech Studios is Mohammed Yakub, uh, and we've been talking about his training as an urban plant evolution <laughs> scientist and all the fun work he did. But but looking now at that, more of that transition where you begin sharing your science a little more broadly rather than working so much in the lab, getting other people excited about science, and you over time got involved in more and more programs. And you you mentioned a program earlier called Market Science, which sounds sort of interesting. What, can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, market Science. 
Um, it's, it's a fun, really fun program. So you see an image there, so that's uh, what market science looks like. And I'll mm -hmm. just um, briefly talk about that. Um, when I was in grad school, like many other grad students, my, um, I too procrastinated writing my dissertation. Mm -hmm. And so one of my friends and I, my colleagues, um, Jessica Bieber and I, we decided that we wanted to go share our science with people out in the community. Mm -hmm. And we decided to start hosting a hands-on science booth at a local farmer's market. Oh, okay. Right, so it would like, people come to the farmer's mm -hmm. market, they are there listening and chatting with, um, mm -hmm. it, it's more of a community. Right. And we wanted to do this in a very informal way. Mm -hmm. um, so we started hosting this booth, it was great. It was just the two of us, we would be there like occasionally hanging out. Over time we got more and more friends, we started doing activities, so mm -hmm. we would bring out like different plants and the um, foods that we eat um, they're sold as a market, and what parts of plants are there, right? So celery is the stalk, ginger is the root, uh, broccoli and cauliflower are the flowers. And we would bring up microscopes. Everyone loves microscopes. Sure, right. Um, and so it was, it was great to be like, you know, we're here, this is what science is. Mm -hmm. um, it need not be just, again, as we've mentioned, um, just in the lab. Right. Cool. Um, and over time, we got great, right? Like, so we got bigger, we had more friends join us. It was basically us friends hanging out. Um, and then at one point we got matching shirts, we got a logo, that's when everything got real, because that's when you know things are real. <laughs> oh, you got a logo, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if you have to look at the first, um, so, I want to slide number four, right? So that's oh, what our market okay. science setup yeah. looks okay. like. And so you can see all the, um, um, and, dissecting yeah, scopes all the that. dissecting scopes right. with the, exactly okay. what I said, like the, right hand the plants and the foods, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, great, great stuff, great stuff. And so that really got you more involved in, in, in doing that, that, some people call outreach, I find that term a little weird, but uh, communicating with the public and sharing yes. science with the public and hearing their questions and being able to answer those questions. It did, yeah. And in fact, um, I'll share this one story um, I remember very distinctly is um, at one point I was there at the market with my friend Beth Fallon and we had a table set up, uh, our um, event was uh, looking at tree cookies, so like the cross sections of trees, which tell you how old the tree is. Mm -hmm. But also, based on the thickness, we'll tell you whether it was a wet wind or wet or a dry season mm -hmm. for the tree. Um, and we had this Somali mom and her son, who was maybe eight, maybe 10. And they came up and he was very excited. And the mom comes up to us and she's like, oh, what do you guys do? And we're like, oh, we're both scientists. You know, like, that studied how plants, how water moves in mm -hmm. oaks and how that's something like mm -hmm. that. I don't remember. I don't want to misspeak mm -hmm. what her work is. And I was studying um, urban ecology. And so we told her that. And she looks at it and she's like, well, I'm glad you guys have hobbies, but what do you do? Like, what's your job? <laughs> right? And so I'm like, oh, right. Like, this is what I get paid to do. Right. Yeah. And she was super excited because to her, again, that whole idea of like scientists are always in lab coats, right. we are not that. Yeah. She said her son really loved climbing trees and she's like, she wanted to foster that interest, but mm -hmm. in a way that would also then help him. Yeah. So you you may, may have helped shape the career of another uh, plant scientist there. <laughs> Wonderful. And so at some point you decided to, to make this jump into this group called Cyline, right? I did. And because and, Cyline, I mean, it's great. They do that same thing except on a big scale because they, they get journalists who are the, sort of the key translators between science on the one hand and the public on the other, right? Exactly. And science journalists, unfortunately, were, were at least sort of a dying breed. I guess maybe Cyline is trying to <laughs> prevent them from going extinct, as it were. Right? We're... I, I don't want to comment, right? I mean, as, as you mentioned, like in the last decade or two, newsrooms have been shrinking mm -hmm. um, significantly. Right. Um, we, and that's, what, that's where Silent actually, the idea of Silent came up is um, there are a lot of newsrooms that now have general reporters. Again, these are good reporters, mm -hmm. but they no longer have, newsrooms don't have science or health right. or environment right. reporters. But those are issues that affect us, how your health, right? Um, and so these general reporters are doing these stories, but they don't have the technical terminology or the background. Right. And they don't have the role of scientists. Right. And so this is where Cyline um, came through and we're essentially trying to connect, create that, those connections. Right, and so one of the ways you do this, I gather, is you bring groups of journalists together and sort of immerse them for a period of time in some science or another, <laughs> we, right? Yes, so we have a variety of services that we do. Um, we do the direct connections, we do media briefings. But we've started doing these, we call them boot camps. Mm -hmm. And they are two-day immersive workshops. So mm -hmm. we did one um, earlier this, we've done three so far. The first one we did was genomics for journalists. Okay. So we did this at the University of Illinois. We brought 30 reporters. Um, and they not only got to learn about um, like the concepts of genetics and genomics, as we mm -hmm. mentioned, that's changing, but they also got to be in lab doing lab work. Um, so and, and that, right. they are doing, um, they're using CRISPR, the CRISPR technology, sure. to really manipulate microbial uh, back, uh, genomes. Cool. cool. Um, and so then they can really understand what that is. Um, this next camp is actually the Science Essentials for Political Reporters. We brought about 30 political reporters to Iowa uh, right ahead of um, right. Right. Uh, right State Fair. Right. And uh, we talked to them about um, issues that may come up. Right. Um, so yes, we know there's science 
research in climate and energy. But there is science, um, there, there's a lot of science research in immigration and trade. And we talked about those as well. Yeah, yeah. And it's great because at the same time, you're, you're putting the scientists much more in touch with uh, questions that the broader public might have about their work, right? It's, Which they probably don't often run into. They, uh, just bring scientists and journalists in the same room. Right. It's great because they're both like, no, you don't understand this, you don't understand this. And after a while, they're like, oh, I see why this, how you respond, right? right. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's fascinating because it's, the two have their both valuable specialties, but they sort of sometimes have their own blinders, right? Yes. And that's, uh, it's wonderful I mean, to bring those And as a together. scientist, I can see, right, like, I don't want to say anything that's not quite confirmed with evidence, so mm -hmm. it might take me a while. Mm -hmm. But journalists have to, like, mm -hmm. report the story, like, it's happening now. Right. Like, if something's, if there's some environmental issue, you don't want to report on it six months later. Right. So I it's understandable on both ends. Yeah, no, well, I, that's what I like about <coughs> your, your tagline on your sideline, like, <laughs> like, expertise uh, and context on deadline, you know. On deadline. Right, I mean, those are all, you don't want that context? You want that context, and yes, the deadline it's, is important to the journalists. You know? It's great. Uh, so that's, um, that's really valuable. And it's, uh, so it's funny, um, it's, it's just, journalists will reach out to us, mm -hmm. and they'll be like, oh, can I, I'm writing a story on whatever topic, can I get a scientist? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's on the, hour of, on the order of hours, mm -hmm. right? And within a few hours, we have, okay, there's a scientist. Right. So that's our main thing that we do, is we really connect them directly. Ah, so they can, they can, okay, my story's ready to go, I, I just need a good quote. And, you know? oh, yeah, and it's more like, I want, I want to understand this. Right. Um, and so I'll share one story. So we get, this is where I've learned, that's two things I've learned is, scientists, there's any kind of research being done, right? We've had stories from like, the group behavior of clapping, mm -hmm. right? Like there's psychology behind that, there's group sure. behavior. To like online memes, how those spread. Mm -hmm. um, so there's topics being done on, there's research being done on everything. Right. And science being done everywhere. Right. Um, we are, we've referred scientists from all 50 states, yes, including Hawaii. Right. Um, and it was great, um, mm -hmm. right, to be like. Well, I had one of your scientists on earlier. Yes, <laughs> well, that too. It was here several months ago. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so no, that, and that's really, that's really uh, incredibly valuable. And the, the, I suspect you try to encourage the journalists to get in touch a little bit earlier than two hours ahead of the oh, The story. longer they can give us, the better it is, right? right? Like if you, a day or two would be great, right. but we will work with whatever deadline there is. Yeah, because their scientists aren't always ready or able. They're, yeah. they're off at a conference or finishing up their own deadlines to get a paper out or a grant proposal out. And, yes. You know, they, they have their own deadlines too. Um, uh, it is funny when we get like the topics and we're like, and we reach out to the scientists and they're like, oh, this week is grant week. And I'm like, okay, it's gonna right. be a little harder. Right. But we'll, it's been great. Yeah, um, We've referred over 1,200 scientists, um, oh. and we've supported over 700 stories, and those are the direct connections, mm -hmm. and not counting the stories that may have come out of other. Right, so these are for uh, newspapers, magazines, uh, online, radio, online, or, yeah. you know, all, the, all the different media. Huh? Everything. Now that's great because so much these days, uh, there seems to be a, an almost blatant disregard for evidence-based. Yeah thinking and reporting, and, and it's, it's wonderful that you guys are, are, it's, are doing this with the, 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 the content, the context. The, yeah. the, I think what's amazing is scientists want to share, right, right. their work. Right. Um, so scientists get federal and state money, like right. our tax dollars go to support science research, and science right. is meant to support us all. Right, um, many scientists are not trained particularly to communicate very effectively with the So science. they are, yes, right. and um, I appreciate platforms like this where mm -hmm. I get to share what mm -hmm. I'm doing, and I know you've had other scientists here, that's great. Yeah. Um, so we are moving a little bit, we'll try to work on the whole like training scientists. Right. Um, and because we are fully philanthropically funded, we, like everything we do is completely free to the reporters, right? Mm -hmm. So we are here to help them. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had half a dozen philanthropists come right. through and be like, we really care about science or journalism or both. Right, so you probably then also archive all these stories that you do so there's somebody else comes up asking for the same kind of topic. You can't we, be live scientists <laughs> and see them. Well, here is what so and so did a while ago. We have that, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, that's great. The other thing that internally we're all so we're a small team of eight, and we're always very really excited about everything new we learn. So every morning we're like, "Oh, did you know about so and so?" And it's great to learn the things that we learn. Yeah, yeah, all the all uh, the obscure stuff that uh, scientists study and, <laughs> and figure out that, that's, that's so so bizarre. Huh? Yeah, and, um, uh, yeah. So it's uh, it's really that this is fascinating stuff, and. So what's, where is Sideline going to go? How, how is it going to grow? What, is it, what, are the, what are the leaders of Sideline want to see in five years? You know, so like I said, there's only eight of us. Uh -huh. And um, my boss is amazing in the sense that every year we have a summit. And we, ours this year happened to be last Friday, right before I left. Uh -huh. um, so I've had a chance to really think about what we talked about. But at the end of the day, we really, all eight of us really came up with like, where do you want to go? And so we're going to start doing a little more trainings for scientists uh -huh. to be able to communicate, to uh -huh. really be like, how can you not just talk about the technical work, but what are the effects for, yeah. right? And what that looks like. Right. 
Um, we want to continue really bringing scientists and reporters together mm -hmm. because we've learned that bringing them in the same space, even however level of formal, informal, it's great. They really get those conversations going. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's absolutely critical work. And yeah. Just, just, that, just, I think it's important to not be overemphasized in, in these days when we sometimes, I feel like it's being sort of downgraded and pushed aside and it's, it's, subverted to. You know, it's or, an interesting yeah, time occasionally yeah. when I look at that. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. so it's, it's great. Yeah. So if, if you had to, having done your interesting career transitions, uh, if, if you had to give advice to an aspiring student who, who looks at that interface of science and, and journalism <laughs> or science and communication, what, what advice would you give to that student? Oh, funny, I should uh, reach out to our interns. We had two interns this summer. They're both at that interface. Mm -hmm. Both amazing people. Like, mm -hmm. I was like, they, um, I don't know how we... Now it feels weird not working with them. Um, but I think the key thing is both science and journalism are changing so much. But having the science, learning the science is great. Like you absolutely should. But learning how to communicate it is also equally important. Mm -hmm. And those skills will help you no matter what direction your research goes. Yeah. Right? Um, you, even if you end up being in a lab all day, that's great. But so long as you know how to talk about it. Right. Yeah, um, you absolutely have to communicate your science. Yeah. Um, one of the things that my boss always says is um, go out and ask, how do you know that, right? Mm -hmm, right. So like whatever you read, whatever story, how do, how do they know that? Right. So we see stories like, oh, how much coffee is good for you? How much coffee is right. bad for you? Well, how do they know that? What do they do the research on? Right. Uh, so it's always how do you know that? Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. And, and my wife sort of jokingly sort of says, you scientists are always changing your minds. You know, one year you're telling us, yeah, well, this is good for you. Next year it's saying it's bad for you. But let's look at how do they do that, right? right? Did they just do it on, like so? I think the whole how do you know that, like that sticks with me a lot more yeah, now. Yeah, that's, that's evidence-based thinking. Which exactly. Is, which is yeah. so, so uh, critical and all. That. Hey, so this is great. Um, folks can access Sciline online. Sciline.org. Yeah, Sciline.org. Yes. S-C-I-L-I-N-E. Yes. Dot org. Uh, and that, that's, that's a, a great organization. I'm sure uh, you know, your website has all kinds of good stuff on it if people want to learn about it or connect local journalists with scientists or connect local scientists with journalists. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and everything we do, again, like I said, is fully philanthropically funded, so everything is also on our website. Yeah. Access for anyone who's yeah. interested. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. Uh, Mohammed, I, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your vacation. You usually like to say science, <laughs> taking time out of your busy schedule. You're, you're on vacation. <laughs> but it's, it's great that you've been able to come here and, and talk about this, and, and I get to sort of meet, in a sense, a peer who's doing the same kind of stuff that I'm doing here on Lifeable <laughs> Science, but through a different, a different channel. Thank you both for having me and for having this kind of channel. This is no, great. No, I, no I, hope, I hope we'll be able to continue collaborating. And if there's ways that I can help Sideline by helping train Sideline. We'll definitely continue you know, this conversation. And, yes. and or vice versa. You know, please, so. please don't, don't hesitate to let me know. Great. Okay, uh, Mohammed Yakub uh, from Sideline has been my guest today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Aloha. <laughs>